Um, so welcome. This is our second uh, named lecture for SBA. This is the Nicolet Lecture, um, which just like the Parker Lecture is given every two out of three years. Um, and this is award from uh, uh, Space Physics and Aeronomy. And this year our winner is Cora Randall. And um, because we love Dan so much, he is going to give this introduction as well. <laughs> I can feel the love. <laughs> so the light disappeared here, so I'll have to. No, it's fine. Um, Cora Randall got her bachelor's degree in chemistry at the State University of New York. She went on to pursue graduate studies in chemistry at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Rather remarkably, given her subsequent research trajectory, Cora's thesis work and postdoctoral research at Carnegie Mellon University involved laser spectroscopy and time resolved measurement of protein folding. However, in coming to the University of Colorado's Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, or LASP, Cora made a major career shift toward study of comets and then remote sensing of Earth's atmosphere. I think our space uh, science community can be immensely grateful that Cora brought her unique um, talents to bear on questions relating to stratospheric ozone depletion, polar mesospheric clouds, atmospheric dynamics, and the topic of her lecture today, energetic particle precipitation. It's been my pleasure to know and work with Cora for over two decades at last in Boulder. I see in Cora a researcher who is extremely well versed in theory, modeling, and data analysis methods. She's worked on many of NASA's most prominent spacecraft missions, and she has emerged in every case as a leader in both thought and deed. Cora has not only been a scientific success, but has also been the complete package as a university faculty member. She has taught highly successful courses in her home academic department of atmospheric and oceanic sciences. She's mentored extremely successful graduate students. Cora has performed remarkable service to the space and earth science communities on the local, national, and international levels. Whether as a department chair or as a highly respected and valued NASA instrument principal investigator, Cora has succeeded in making a difference. Cora's record shows that she's highly prolific, having published over 150 research articles in the refereed literature and having given a comparable number of invited talks, colloquia, and seminars around the world. Her service record just at the University of Colorado alone runs to multiple pages in length. She has distinguished herself time and again with her exemplary work in public outreach and, and professional engagement. Her remarkable research attainments have led to multiple awards, including election as fellow of the AGU, also fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's been gratifying for me to see Cora uh, grow from a junior research associate to a world-recognized leader in an area of great basic and applied importance, solar terrestrial coupling. Cora and her team have pursued the, with passion and immense dedication the question of how Earth's deep atmosphere layers respond to influence of solar and magnetospheric particle energy input. Cora's careful and thoughtful work in this area has taken the research from a realm of controversy and speculation to a field that is being placed on a firm quantitative footing. It is my distinct privilege and honor again to introduce, to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Cora Randall as the 2019 Nicolet Lecture speaking on the topic, Heliosphere Atmosphere Coupling by Energetic Particle Precipitation. Please join me in welcoming Cora to give this lecture. Thank you, Dan, for that introduction, and thanks, Christina, and the um, <clears throat> Space Physics and Aeronomy Committee for inviting me to give this lecture. So as Dan said, I'm going to be talking about heliosphere atmosphere coupling uh, via energetic particle precipitation. And just very, very briefly, I'll give some background and motivation, look at the historical perspective, and then uh, say a little bit about recent observations of both the um, effects of EPP, energetic particle precipitation, on the atmosphere and some recent modeling results, 
There's really not enough time to give an overview of all of it, but I'll hit some examples and then talk about some outstanding issues. So this is a schematic from Dan and Allison Janes uh, showing uh, kind of in a nutshell the topic that we're talking about. So precipitating electrons and solar protons will produce HOX and NOx. This is odd hydrogen and odd nitrogen. They destroy ozone catalytically. So that is really the reason in the context of this talk that we're interested in it. Um, NOx is uh, atomic nitrogen, NO and NO2, and then HOX is HOH and HO2. <clears throat> the uh, altitude to which uh, energetic particles uh, uh, deposit their energy depends on the energy of the particle itself. So auroral electrons with energies less than, say, 30 keV will deposit their energy in the thermosphere. Medium energy electrons will deposit their energy in the mesosphere. And then relativistic electrons with energies greater than about 1 MeV will reach all the way down to the stratosphere. And we generally characterize the EPP effects as either being direct or indirect. The direct effect refers to the local production of NOx and HOx and the consequent ozone loss in that production region. The indirect effect, on the other hand, refers to the transport of NOx away from the production region and any consequent ozone loss. Um, note that in the indirect effect, I have not included HOx, and that's because HOx has a very short lifetime, so it really is not relevant to the indirect effect. So the direct effect is pretty straightforward. The indirect effect is a little bit more complex, so I just have this uh, slide to go into a little bit more detail. Uh, NOx is first formed in the, the mesosphere and lower thermosphere, not to be confused with magnetic local uh, time. Um, so it, it's formed in the upper atmosphere and through a cascade of various reactions. Um, it is, uh, it, it's produced and then descends in the polar vortex during the winter. So it has to be, um, you cannot have a lot of sunlight because that will dissociate the NOx, so therefore this is required to happen during the winter. Um, and then when it gets to the stratosphere, it will destroy ozone. In fact, the NOx is the um, most important catalytic cycle at altitudes of about 22 to 40 kilometers, uh, which is most of the stratosphere. Why are we interested in this? Well, ozone is um, a radiatively active gas. So if you change polar ozone, that means that you're going to change the latitudinal gradient in temperature. If you change the gradient in temperature, that will affect the winds, and that can affect the um, propagation of waves. Then, of course, if you change the propagation of waves, you can change the entire circulation, feeding back on the distribution of ozone. So you have this whole coupling process. So changes in polar ozone, then, can trigger we believe a redistribution of the solar and magnetospheric energy at Earth, and therefore you have this whole coupling of the upper and the lower atmosphere. A question that we're still trying to understand is whether the extent to which EPP affects climate. This is another schematic from Dan Baker, um, just kind of putting together what I have explained already about direct and indirect effects, where you get EPP creating NOx and HOx. Um, HOX will destroy ozone in the mesosphere. That might lead to effects on the dynamics. That might be felt all the way down to the surface. I think that's still an open question. Um, then you can also have NOx, which can descend in the polar winter, destroying ozone in the stratosphere. And again, that might affect the dynamics. Okay, so the whole idea of EPP-induced coupling um, has been recognized as a possibility for some time. So Susan Solomon wrote a paper in 1980 where she was focusing on auroral electrons. And just some quotes from the paper, large amounts of NO are produced in the lower thermosphere through auroral ionization. Substantial amounts of NO produced in the thermosphere can reach the stratosphere, particularly at high latitudes during polar winter. This process provides a coupling between the upper and lower atmosphere. So she was essentially talking about what we now call the indirect effect, and this was in 1980. There was no observational evidence at that point. Um, another paper written in 97 by Michael Kudrescu um, focused on medium energy electrons and basically saying the same thing that we might expect an indirect effect from, from this. And then Dan uh, wrote a paper in 1987 where he introduced the idea for relativistic electrons, saying, we conclude that this previously unrecognized electron population could play an important role in coupling solar wind and magnetospheric variability to the middle atmosphere through a modulating effect on lower D-region ionization and possibly on upper level ozone chemistry. So the ideas have been out there, and the question is, to what extent is this happening? <clears throat> I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Um, so. 
I'm moving on now just to talk about a little bit more of the history. How did we get here and then where are we headed? So Charlie Jackman in um, a paper in 1980 wrote that the odd nitrogen budget of the stratosphere and mesosphere has received considerable attention owing to its rev relevance in the ozone balance and in the formation of the ionospheric D region. As Dan said, I actually um, started, when I came into atmospheric science, I was working on ozone depletion, and so I'm coming from an ozone balance perspective uh, here. So in 1930, Sidney Chapman proposed a set of reactions to explain the presence and the abundance of stratospheric ozone. The production would be from photolysis of, of molecular oxygen and the destruction photolysis of ozone. But as it was quickly realized that that mechanism that he proposed predicted too much ozone over much of the globe. So you have the predicted ozone here with quite a bit of ozone at the tropical latitudes, but the measured ozone was much more constant with latitude. The solution was to add catalytic ozone destruction. So this is the basic reaction for the catalysis, where you have a catalyst reacting with ozone, but then being regenerated in the set of reactions. And the catalyst, uh, for the purposes here, we're mostly interested in H, OH, and NO, uh, CL and BR are also important, but not for the energetic particle effects. So in 1950, Nicolay, um, working with Bates, suggested the first Hox catalytic cycle where the catalyst was H. This is most important in the mesosphere. And then in 1970, Nicolay again suggested a second Hox catalytic cycle where the catalyst is OH, and this is more important in the upper stratosphere. And then finally, in 1970, Crutzen suggested the Knox catalytic cycle, which, as I've said, is the most important cycle from about 22 to 40 kilometers or so in the stratosphere. So with these three cycles, the uh, progression, the distribution of stratospheric ozone was explained much better. Crutzen, in a 1970 paper, wrote, there's a distinct possibility that nitro nitrogen oxides are of great importance in ozone photochemistry. In the first place, we urgently need observations on their concentrations in the stratosphere. At that point, we really hadn't had very much in the way of measurements. He went on to say, investigations about N2O, so nitrous oxide, that's laughing gas, should be continued and extended in order to establish if N2O is an important source for odd nitrogen in the upper atmosphere. So at this point, we didn't really know what was the source of the NOx in the stratosphere. Um, N2O had, had been suggested, but, but nobody had really confirmed it. But then he went on to say, if, however, most of the stratospheric NO and NO2 is produced at very high levels by other processes, some solar cycle influence on the ozone layer will be possible. So he was thinking, of course, of whether or not energetic particles might be creating some of the NOx. <clears throat> Just two years later, Nicolay wrote another paper where he was looking at the production of nitric oxide, and he made the suggestion that it was the oxidation of nitrous oxide that actually produced NO. And this is still the accepted mechanism today for most of the nitric oxide in the global stratosphere. Um, so by 1980, skipping a few years, um, there was wide acceptance of the importance of EPP NOx and EPP HOX for middle atmosphere chemistry. So in that year, there were two papers that were written that kind of reviewed where we were at the time, um, and they were mostly focusing on the sources of NOx, and Charlie Jackman uh, put out a chart that looked something like this, his was in black and white, um, that gave various sources, including the N2O and solar protons as well as energetic electrons. And then Richard Thorne also wrote a paper where he was talking about the NOx and HOX chemistry. And I thought he had some very prescient quotes where he said, future satellite studies should be directed at simultaneously measuring the precipitation flux and the concommitment atmosphere modification. And these results should be employed to develop more sophisticated models of this important coupling. Of particular importance are realistic transport processes in conjunction with the anticipated chemical modifications. Only then can one assess the overall importance of particle precipitation on the global scale. And I should say, I could probably end the talk right now, because frankly, this is where we are right now. So this really was prescient on his point. We still need more observations, in particular, the uh, uh, precipitation flux along with the atmospheric modification, and then also trying to understand the uncertainties in transport. 
but I will go on and talk about some more evidence that hopefully will convince you um, that we really are in that situation right now. So the first satellite evidence for the EPP indirect effect came in 1978 to 1979. Well, actually, it was published in 1984, but referred to the winter of 78-79. This is from the LIM infrared monitor of the stratosphere, or LIMS instrument. LIMS measured NO2, and you can see here a plot of NO2 from November through March of 78 to 79 versus altitude. And this was at 75 north. You can see this tongue of high NO2 descending from the mesosphere into the stratosphere. We knew even then that, that EPP was the only source of NOx in the polar winter mesosphere, so this was immediately attributed to EPP NOx. Unfortunately, um, LIMS only lasted less than a year, and there really was insufficient satellite data in the 1980s to do global observational studies of EPP effects. Lynn Callis, in 1991, wrote, in attempting to examine the long-term changes in global NO, one is immediately confronted with a less than satisfactory database. This was an understatement. Um, Lynn, uh, however, really um, did a lot of work with the data that we had, trying to combine the observational data with models in order to understand as much as we could about the EPP effects. Um, uh, but fortunately, in the 1990s and again in the 2000s, the um, observations really improved with new satellite instruments. So one of those instruments was the Upper Atmosphere Research Satellite Halogen Occultation Experiment. So this was a solar occultation experiment called HALO. Dave Siskind uh, wrote a paper in 2001 where he was looking at observations of NOx inside the southern hemisphere polar vortex in October. So this is, you know, during the springtime, um, you still had a very stable vortex. And what this plot here shows is the mixing ratio of NOx here for various years, 91 through 1996. Um, and then also shows some methane profiles. The significance of this is that methane is a transport of, tr is, sorry, is a tracer of atmospheric transport. So very low values of methane mean that the air came from the mesosphere. So he was able to conclude that all of these enhancements in NOx that you see in, in these years here were really air that came from the mesosphere. And as I said, the only source of EP, of NOx at that, at that time in those altitudes is EPP. Um, so he knew that that was the case, and then, although I'm not showing it, data from another instrument, the Polar Ozone and Aerosol Measurement Instrument, showed that there was a commensurate ozone depletion with these high NOx values. Um, combining data from both POEM and HALO, um, we looked at uh, what happened after the Bastille Day solar proton event, and here you can see there was quite a bit of excess NOx in uh, the year 2000. This is in September to October at high southern latitudes compared to all of the other years that HALO had data. And at the same time, we were able to show that from the, using the POEM instrument that there was a big depletion in ozone in the middle stratosphere that was not present in 1999 when you did not have any solar proton event. I should say, though, that this was the evidence, even at this point, was not limited to just solar proton events. It was also clear that this happened when there were no solar proton events. So using the HALO data and the technique that Dave Siskin and Jim Russell had introduced where methane is used as a transport tracer, we were able to quantify the amount of NOx that descended into the stratosphere. And this is the, uh, the quantification here in the very intuitive units of gigamoles. Um, but to, to put that into context, um, we were able to show that EPP NOx, so the NOx from energetic particle precipitation, accounts for up to about 10% of the total global NOI in the southern hemisphere that comes from the N2O oxidation. But perhaps more importantly is it accounts for up to 40% of the odd nitrogen in the, in the polar region. And this is because, of course, the energetic particle of effects are more important in the polar region, and also because the NO coming from uh, N2O comes mostly at the lower latitudes and then needs to be transported up to the poles in order to um, be represented there. So it was clear at this point that, that we really do need to understand EPP NOx in order to understand the distribution of stratospheric ozone. You can see that there's quite a bit of interannual variability here. Um, 
not surprisingly, we were able to show that, that this correlated very well with the AP index as well as auroral and MEE power, MEE meaning medium energy electron, um, and thermospheric NO measured by the SNOWY instrument. But here you can see in black is the, um, uh, the EPP NOx, and then in red is the AP index. So the conclusion then is that, was that variability in the southern hemisphere, stratospheric NOx from EPP, was controlled by variation in the production of EPP NOx. You know that it, of course, has to depend also on the descent, um, how much air is actually descending from the mesosphere into the stratosphere. But in the southern hemisphere, that, that descent tends to be strong and not extremely variable from year to year. So that's why we were able to conclude that the variations from year to year really were due to production, not transport. That's not the case in the northern hemisphere, where the vortex is much less stable and more variable, and so transport from year to year is much more variable. Um, so after the Halloween storms, there was a lot more interest in EPP effects. It really accelerated, uh, partly maybe because of the Halloween storms. Another thing was that the Halloween storms had big effects in the northern hemisphere, which really hadn't been seen as much before. We had mostly been focusing on the southern hemisphere. Another thing is that there were a lot more instruments available to look at some of these uh, processes. Um, this, uh, this, these um, results here had gotten a lot of attention because they were so anomalous. Here what you're seeing is um, NO2 on the left and ozone on the right at around 40 kilometers, so in the upper stratosphere, in the Arctic region, measured by the POEM instrument. And it shows data from 1994 through 2004, but you can see how much excess NO2 was present in, 19, in, excuse me, in 2004, and at the same time, we got a large depletion in ozone. Um, at first, uh, you know, the initial thoughts were this must be due to the Halloween storms. This was happening in the spring of 2004, so several months after the Halloween storms. We realized pretty quickly that that couldn't be the case, that the NOx created by the Halloween storms would have dissipated by this point, and so it's now widely accepted that, in fact, what was going on is there was excess uh, or enhanced particle activity in January, but what was really critical in this year was that there was enhanced descent in the mesosphere, much more um, uh, descent than usual in the northern hemisphere uh, mesosphere. So talking about that a little bit more, here are a number of observations from the atmospheric chemistry experiment Fourier transform spectrometer. So this is a solar occultation instrument. What I'm showing here is NOx, NO plus NO2, plotted as a function of time during the winter months, January to March, and altitude in years from 2004 all the way up to 2018. In a number of these years, you can see this tongue of NOx coming down. So this one here in 2004 is, uh, represents the an enhancement that I just showed you on the previous slide, but you also get these tongues in other years. In some of the other years, you get, looks like a little bit of descent, and then there are other years where maybe very little, if at all, is actually descending down. So what's going on here? It turns out that the years when you really get a lot of EPP NOx coming down are also years where you had sudden stratospheric warmings followed by elevated stratopauses. Um, so what, what, is, what does this really mean? This is an example of an elevated stratopause event. This is data from the sounding of the atmosphere using broadband emission radiometry, the SABER instrument on the time satellite. We're looking at temperature observations here from uh, the 10th of January for a couple months um, versus altitude. And you can see, this is at a latitude of 70 to 75 north. You can see here is the stratopause. This would be the normal stratopause around 50 kilometers or so. When a stratospheric warming occurs because of planetary wave activity, that stratopause de declines in altitude. So that's what happened. But then, interestingly, this year, it actually reformed up here at around 80 kilometers or so. Um, so this, it formed in what would normally be the mesosphere, but this is the stratopause at this point. So it was the recovery from the stratospheric warming um, that caused this, this stratopause to form up here. That is evidence for adiabatic warming in the, what is normally the mesosphere. 
Um, the adiabatic warming itself is an indicator of enhanced descent. So you're bringing down more air from the mesosphere into the stratosphere. That air has NOx created by EPP. Even in times of low solar activity or low geomagnetic activity, you're still going to get production of NOx. And that's really what was being brought down here. The circulation here, it's, it's a complex process, but it's basically driven by gravity waves. <clears throat> so um, this is a uh, plot here that Baron Funke um, put together. These are MEPAS, um, Nicholson Interferometer Passive Atmospheric Sounding observations of the indirect effect. Here on the top is the southern hemisphere, on the north is the northern hemisphere, and you can see in the southern hemisphere it's fairly regular how much comes down. In the northern hemisphere there's a lot more variability and a lot of that ex is explained because of the dynamics. Okay, so what, what are the models saying? How well do we really understand this? Um, Baron Funke et al. Um, also wrote a paper in 2011 where they were describing a community workshop results. This is the high energy particle precipitation in the atmosphere, um, model measurement in comparison, looking at the Halloween storms from 2003. And they were um, looking at ozone loss. The observed ozone loss that they, uh, the MEPAS instrument showed was about 30% in the upper stratosphere. This was um, shortly after the solar proton events. This plot here shows the ozone profiles um, that came from a number of different models that, that they were all intercomparing. Um, you can see there's quite a bit of variability in the models. The average um, is right around a peak loss of about 30%. So there's pretty reasonable agreement between the, the models and the observation. The variability and differences in the models, they uh, ascribe to probably differences in the initial state, maybe in the meteorology, how the, the models really handled all of the, the different transport. But, but the main conclusion was for solar proton events, we understand fairly well how to model the, the um, effects soon after the proton event. Um, this was not the case, though, for the delayed, the, the effects in the northern hemisphere spring, which, I, again, as I said, where they were not due to the Halloween storms, that it was the Halloween storms that just got people excited about it, um, and uh, instead were due to relatively high levels of energetic particle precipitation, but really it was that enhanced descent. So um, we ran some uh, uh, model calculations using the specified dynamics version of the whole atmosphere community climate model, or SD WACM, um, and compared it to measurements from ACE. So you've already seen these measurements before with this tongue of NOx coming down. Um, but the model really completely misses it. It, it has nothing there. So this model um, in, included auroral EPP and the solar proton events, which were no longer um, acting at that time. But um, but it did not include any higher energy electrons. So one of the things that we concluded was that we, that was probably a, a mistake not to have the, the elect, higher energy electrons in there. Um, uh, but the, all, the other thing is we knew by comparing temperatures in the model to observed temperatures that it was not simulating the dynamics properly either. So we, our conclusion was we needed to improve the simulation of the transport, at least during these dynamically active winters, and we had to include the higher energy EPP. Um, <clears throat> other model calculations um, by uh, Berend was, uh, Funke had, he had compared a number of different models. I'm only showing two examples here, Wacom and Harmonia. This was a comparison of the 2009 Northern Hemisphere winter. This was another one of these dynamically active winters when we had an elevated stratopause event. But this winter was different in that there was really very little geomagnetic activity at the time. But again, even with little activity, you still get NOx being produced. So what, these, what he showed here was if you compare the observations to the models, again, you get a big underestimate. And then um, looking at another year, 2013, when again there was uh, this um, elevated stratopause event, um, th these plots are a little bit difficult to look at in that we have blacked out the SOFI, uh, this is solar occultation for ice experiment, um, which is on the Aronomy of Ice and the Mesosphere mission. But we blacked out the areas where, um, where SOFI is insensitive, and that really corresponds to some of these blue areas. But if you look just in the tongue, you can see that, again, Wacom is underestimating it in this year. An interesting study that Dave Siskind is going to talk about tomorrow in the poster session um, is he has taken SD Wacom and, again, is comparing the descent 
of Knox and it to the descent in measured by Sophie. But this time what he's done is he has taken Wacom and he has nudged it to a meteorological, well, a weather model really in the mesosphere. So SD, specified dynamics Wacom, what that does is, is you can nudge the lower atmosphere, the stratosphere and troposphere to observations um, to basically meteorological analyses. So that allows you to get the transport pretty much correct in the stratosphere and troposphere. But the mesosphere is still free running, so that can still be a weakness in the model. When you nudge to this NAVGEM model, that should in, um, make the, the transport in the mesosphere much better. And indeed, these comparisons are, are better than what the other ones were. There's still an underestimate, but at least it improved it. One issue here, though, is that if you specify all the dynamics and then use assimilated data in the mesosphere, um, you can test chemistry, but you can't test coupling because you can't test whether or not the model is correctly um, simulating the radiative transfer effects from depleting the ozone. So we, of course, would like to get them both correct. So one of the things I've said that we are missing is these higher energy electrons. And there has been quite a bit of work in just the last few years on trying to specify medium energy electrons. Um, so energies of about 30 to 1,000 keV. Um, all of the work is based on the MEPED, medium energy proton and electron detector. This, these detectors being flown on a number of different satellites um, have a number of problems with them. They are not well calibrated in that there are um, uh, problems with proton contaminating, protons contaminating the electron channels and vice versa. Um, they do not have high spectral resolution. They just have several uh, integrated uh, spectral bands. And they do not look at the entire loss cone. So they have a, um, just a zero degree detector and a 90 degree detector. So there are definitely some problems with these detectors. Nevertheless, it's what we have. And so we're trying to get as much information as we can. So um, Max Vandekamp, created a long-term data set where what he did is he parameterized the MEPED data based on the AP index so that he could then go back in time in order to use the MEPED measurements essentially for climatological um, uh, data. And he only used the zero degree MEPED detector for this, but he made this long data set. Nobody else had actually ever had a long data set before, and the community decided to recommend it for the coupled model in comparison project phase six which is a big climate model comparison. Um, and this is representing then the first inclusion of these medium energy electrons in a large climate model intercomparison. So it's a real step in the right direction. Um, unfortunately, there are some major problems with the data set. So we're working to improve it, but they're not gonna get into the CMIP-6 um, simulations. This just gives you an example of the problem. So this is from Irina Marinova, um, just published this year. What she did was she estimated the MEE ionization rates from balloon measurements, and this is the profile here, um, taken over Russia, and then um, calculated using the CMIP-6 database um, the ionization rate um, from Max Vandekamp's uh, database. Um, but you can see this is on a log scale. <laughs> So there's a, a pretty big underestimation of the um, ionization rate in the mesosphere. In, um, so Hilde Nessitisoy has been developing her own database using MEPED, but in this case, she used both the zero and the 90 degree detectors. Um, and what she did was after producing this data set, she then calculated the ionization rates and the OH production using this University of Bremen model. Um, and then compared the model simulations of OH to observations from the microwave limb sounder and got reasonable agreement. Actually, if anything, she's over predicting how much OH there should be. So her conclusion is, you know, to get rid of this underestimate, we should include the data sets from both the zero and 90 degree detectors. But because we don't have a full pitch angle dependence, it's difficult to know exactly how to do that. Um, then Josh Pettit, um, who's also going to be giving, he's going to be giving a talk tomorrow. Um, he has another MEE data set. Um, again, it does use both the zero and 90 degree detectors. It extends the energy range out to one MEV. The other ones used only up to 300 keV. Um, we would love to extend it even further, but right now we don't have a, a parameterization for the higher energy electrons. Most people have been using the uh, parameterization of, of Xiaohua Fang 
um, but that's limited to one MEV. So we're working now, um, in particular Bob Marshall, to extend that parameterization out farther. Um, but in any case, uh, what Josh did is he um, put these, uh, his medium energy electron data set into uh, Wacom and, whoops, sorry. Um, and here are the comparisons with the MEPAS data, so this is the observations, and then he did a run without MEE from then the MEE from the CMIP6 database and then his own data set. And this is, he is looking at the 2003 Southern Hemisphere. And the reason he chose the Southern Hemisphere is because the dynamics are more constant there. And so we were hopeful that dynamics, incorrect dynamics in the model would not be as much of a problem and that differences between the model and observations could be attributed to the uh, in, incorrect MEE. Um, we're still working on how much of the differences are due to dynamics or not. But you can see that in any case, this MP15 data set looks um, much closer to the observations. It still, it still underestimates them, but is better than the other two data sets. And one of the interesting things from his paper is that um, even looking at 40 to 50 degrees south, so in the mid-latitudes, you actually see quite a bit of NOx descending into the stratosphere. Um, and again, the, the MP15, Josh's data set, um, uh, looks like it's better for simulating that, but still an underestimate. So the, um, there's a whole community um, that's working together to try and um, optimize the MEE uh, ionization. So this is from the High Energy Particle Precipitation in the Atmosphere, or HEPA. <laughs> Uh, model measurement in a comparison project. This is actually the third one that they have done. This is the first one that's really focused on medium energy electrons being led by um, Miriam Sinhuber and Hilda Nessie Tissoy. So what they're doing is comparing simulations of um, April 2010 when there was quite a bit of particle activity. They're using a number of different models, different um, with all of these different data sets uh, from MEE trying to understand, you know, what would really be the optimum data set. Okay, what else is missing? Um, this is a plot that um, Dan Baker um, uh, sent to me. What we're showing here is NO column density in the mesosphere lower thermosphere above the Shova station in Antarctica from 2012 through 2000, 2017. This black line is the average of the data. And you can see that there's quite a bit of variability, but in particular, 2014 showed very low column NO uh, density. So the question is, is what's going on there? And they looked at, um, they compared this NO column data to measurements from the Van Allen probes, looking at the electron flux at 1.8 MeV and 4.2 MeV. And you can see that at the same time that we had this low NO column density, you also had a decrease in the flux of these high energy electrons. And although not shown here, it turns out that the medium energy electrons actually did not exhibit a pronounced decrease. So the conclusion from this is that the, it's the precipitations of the electrons with energies greater than one MeV that are really doing the work here, and therefore those need to be included in the models as well. We're, we're not there yet. Um, I, think, I don't think any of the models, the big climate models, actually have any high energy electrons in them. All right, there are a number of other things that are missing um, that I, I don't have time to go through, but just you can see there's four papers here from 2018, all of which showed um, some problems with the models where we weren't simulating the, um, the indirect effect um, a, as we would like to. But I'm gonna um, go to my summary, um, which, which includes those deficiencies. So uh, first of all, it's well accepted that EPP impacts the middle atmosphere through both the direct and indirect effects. It's clear we've seen the, the uh, effects on both the NOx and on the ozone, as well as HOx and ozone in the mesosphere. The models in general capture EPP, EPP effects. They certainly show the production of NOx and HOx, the depletion of ozone, but the model measurement differences can certainly be significant. Um, the model dynamics are not properly captured. Um, there's generally too little descent in the upper mesosphere, and the models lack an adequate representation of both the medium energy and the relativistic energy particles in winters with high geomagnetic activity. Whether or not there are effects all the way down to the surface, I had one slide, uh, actually I had several slides that I, I skipped, 
uh, that did show uh, there have been a number of papers, both observational and theoretical, that have suggested that indeed there are effects all the way down to the surface where you get uh, temperature perturbations of up to plus or minus five degrees Kelvin uh, regionally in years with high particle activity versus years with low particle, particle activity. But there are also um, calculations or models that suggest that there, there are no effects down to the surface. So that is really unclear right now. We are not going to be able to sort that out, though, until we get the models to accurately reproduce what's going on in the middle and upper atmosphere. And for that, we need to understand the descent and the production better. So what do we need okay, for precipitating particles? We have to observe the pitch angle distribution of the electrons with better sp spectral res resolution than MEPED. So we only have, first of all, we only have the 0 and 90 degree detectors, but then we also only have these integrated spectral bands. So we need both, the, the pitch angles and the spectrum. Um, we also need continuous observations of NOx and tracers in the polar night from the stratosphere up into the thermosphere. Um, an awful lot of the measurements that I was talking about were either short-lived or they were only at certain latitudes, they, they were not global, um, or they didn't go up all the way into the mesosphere and lower thermosphere, um, or they required sunlight, so they were never in the polar region. So we have yet to really have a comprehensive data set of the chemistry. The atmospheric dynamics. Um, Okay, for this, it really depends, our understanding depends a lot on what is going on with the planetary and gravity waves. The gravity waves in particular are quite difficult. We do have some observations globally of gravity waves at different altitudes in the atmosphere, but these observations are made by very different types of observing techniques, and it's very difficult to be able to synthesize one observation with another. You might see waves at, say, 30 kilometers, and then you go up to 50 kilometers and, and you don't see them, but you don't know if that's because of the instrumental effects or because the waves really didn't propagate that far. So in order to understand the sources, the evolution, and the impacts of gravity waves, we really need to do a better job of synthesizing all of the measurements that we have of gravity waves. And then on the mod modeling end, we have to really take those observations that we still need to make and, of course, incorporate that knowledge into the model. So we need to simulate the full energy range of the precipitating electrons um, and we have to improve the treatment of the subgrid scale waves. So I'd like to end just by acknowledging um, first that, again, the AGU Space Physics and Aeronomy, Christina, for inviting me here. Um, most of my funding comes from the NSF, NASA, and the Naval Research Laboratory. The HEPA Solaris community, that's a, a big community of people who have really made a lot of progress in the last couple decades, and I have to thank them for all of the work that they have done. Um, then I have some, just some personal um, acknowledgments for some people who have, uh, I've collaborated with an awful lot of people, but these are some of the people who um, have really supported me a lot in recent years. Um, as Dan alluded to, um, when I came into this field, well, you know, I had done my PhD on time-resolved birefringence and linear dichroism of heme proteins, so um, myoglobin and hemoglobin, and I did postdoctoral research on rhodopsin and how it absorbs light. Um, so I came into this field really not knowing anything about atmospheric science. I was probably embarrassed to say. I don't think I could have told you which was higher, the stratosphere or the troposphere. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so, you know, it has taken a, a lot of support, a lot of collaboration, and a lot of understanding really new languages in order to um, carry out some of this work, so I just want to acknowledge some of the people who have helped a lot. And finally, um, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Tori. Uh, questions or comments for Nora? Um, this time, because it's a little hard to hear, we have a microphone set up here, which if you would like to come up here, uh, this lecture, of course, is being taped, and so your comments or brilliant questions will go down in posterity, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> or you could just yell from there. <laughs>
Yes, thank you for bringing that up. So I tried to make sure I said, in the context of this talk, <laughs> um, I was looking at the climate effects. It is true that the ozone is, of course, very important for blocking UV radiation. Um, the effects that we have seen so far from energetic particles have caused, at the most, maybe a 3% reduction in, um, uh, in the radiation. This is, this is calculating a theoretical calculation. So while, and in fact, I, a slide that I took out actually had the energetic particle effects are, we believe, are mostly relevant above about 22 kilometers. Um, the, the ozone hole itself is mostly um, 22 kilometers down to 12 or 13, 14 kilometers, something like that. So I always try to make the point that, that it really is not the ozone hole that we are so interested in right now. But I should also point out that as the ozone hole recovers, NOx chemistry, even in the southern hemisphere stratosphere during the um, uh, springtime when we have the ozone hole, is going to be much more important because suddenly you're not, well, not suddenly, you know, eventually you will not be having as much ozone depletion from the halogens, um, and so NOx is going to be much more of the story in the southern hemisphere during what is now the ozone hole time period, assuming people uh, stick with the Montreal Protocol, which I think they're doing again after we found that there were still some emissions that shouldn't have been there. Any other questions, comments? Um, I, yeah, okay, I'll repeat the question. Um, so he was asking me, um, you know, about my rather unusual trajectory for my career where I went from protein folding to, um, to earth atmosphere research and maybe what were some of the challenges for that. Um, so, so when I first got into science, actually, I got into science thinking, well, at first I was going to major in music, and then, and then the the professor who was my randomly assigned advisor happened to be a chemistry professor, and I said, I want to graduate in three years. Can you let me do that? <laughs> and he said, sure, if you're a chemistry major. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, um, so, so that kind of started me out, and then it, it, there was really a lot of serendipity here. Um, that same professor actually, a number of years later, um, introduced me to his wife's brother, who is now my husband. But I was in California at the time. He was in Boulder at the time. And I said, I really want to move to Boulder. <laughs> so I just sent out applications to jobs. And one of them was at, at Boulder at CU LASP. And it was actually to work on the Hubble Space Telescope and to look at comet, comet spectroscopy. I knew nothing about comets. I knew nothing about telescopes. Um, I knew a little bit about spectroscopy, though. And so I said, great, this would be fun. I mean, working on the Hubble Space Telescope, this was before the telescope was launched, so it was really an exciting time. Um, so, I, so I went to Boulder, worked on that, and then the instrument got taken out of the Space Telescope, and it just happened to be, that was in 1993 or four, it just happened to be that the polar ozone and aerosol measurement team was looking for somebody who could help calibrate their data, who knew a little bit about spectroscopy. And so I was able to join that team, and then I've been doing Earth Atmosphere ever since. The hard part about that, well, so first of all, for all the younger people in the audience, I would say, um, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily the science that's driving you. That's great if it is, but switching is fine if you have other passions, and for me, it happened to be my husband, but, um, <laughs> which maybe is a little bit opposite to Peggy's talk there, but <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway. Um, but I would say the biggest challenge is in the communication and the vocabulary, because we might be talking about the same thing in different fields, but we use different words. And one example that I like to give is ion. So coming from a chemistry background, I was pretty sure I knew what an ion was. But I started um, taking an astronomy 
course when I was at CU just to, just to get educated since I was gonna work on the Hubble Space Telescope. And they kept talking about ions as if they were positively charged. There was no such thing as a negative ion. And I'm thinking, why are you making this assumption? It wasn't until later that I read the glossary in the back of the book and it said, well, ions can have any other charge, but generally, the, generally they're assumed to be positively charged. And this was because it was coming from an astronomy perspective. I would never have thought that they could you know, just be positively charged. So anyway, it, language is, is a barrier, so you need to get through that. But you know, it's exciting to be able to switch. And, and I, I hope that I bring a more diverse perspective to the field maybe um, helps me to be a little bit you know, creative with what I'm thinking about. Uh, another question back there. That's an unfair question. <laughs> I, I will answer it with an unfair answer. <laughs> we need them both. But, but I also think that we can have them both. We, we are making some measurements of gravity waves. We are making some measurements of particles. Um, we need to improve both of them. Um, I, you know, not only for this topic, but for other topics, you know, gravity waves are very important for many things. Energetic particles are very important for many things. It's, it would be, it's almost like comparing apples and oranges. For this particular topic, you really do need both. All right, I know that we have to move to another building to catch agency night, which can't start without me and Jeff, even though it's supposed to start at 6.15. So I'm um, going to thank Cora again. And wrap